Hello, welcome everybody. Today we'll have a very interesting conversation about the problem of evil. I myself, as you know, am a Christian uh, and the, the, the guest I will speak with today, Brandon Parker, is an atheist. So I think this is going to be an interesting conversation. I really look forward to this uh, talk. Uh, for the record, uh, this is not a debate. It is a dialogue. So we will be interested in uh, each other's perspectives and uh, yeah, just we'll see how it goes and uh, if we can learn something from each other. So um I think uh, the best thing to do is start with a short introduction. So, Brandon, uh, why don't you start with uh, introducing yourself? Yeah, hi all. Thanks for uh, having me. Uh, my name is Brandon. Um, I live in Utrecht. I've studied philosophy in Utrecht as well. Um, and uh, I finished my master's in 2014 already, uh, which is a long time ago. Uh, and I like to have deep discussions, of course, uh, especially the topic of religion is interesting to me because I just like to understand why people believe what they do. So uh, I really look forward to this discussion. Yeah. And what's interesting to mention is that uh, we actually met during our students uh, time in Utrecht. I studied in Utrecht as well. And we uh, had uh, very interesting discussions in pubs and uh, other places. And uh, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> Since then, we've had discussions on uh, Facebook and social media as well. And uh, we decided to, yeah, uh, talk on YouTube as well. So um, I look forward to it. I myself am Karel de Lange and I, uh, I haven't always been a Christian. Uh, I grew up in a Christian home, but uh, my father wasn't a Christian, but my mother is. So I had a, a choice. I could go with my mom or with my dad. And I went with my dad. And I decided to do nothing with uh, faith. And then uh, after a while, I, um, when I was 23, uh, I w no, 21 actually, uh, I was thinking about life and about uh, what it's all about. And I was really enjoying life. But at the same time, I realized that, um, yeah, I didn't have much meaning in it. I, I was asking them the big questions like, where do we come from? Is there life after death? And I realized that, we all will die one day and whether we have a good time now, it doesn't really matter because it will, it will all end in the grave. And that was like quite a depressing thought. And then I decided to investigate my own philosophy, which was kind of hedonistic. And I discovered that there is actually very good evidence for the existence of God. And then after a long uh, search and uh, uh, investigation, I became a Christian uh, and, uh, I uh, was convinced uh, by apo apologists, uh, people who defend the faith, and uh, I realized that the Christian faith isn't just something uh, that people just choose to believe on based on their feelings, based on because they want to believe it or something, but that there's a really big uh, intellectual side to it. And uh, yeah, so that's when I became a Christian and became passionate about apologetics because uh, it made such a huge difference in uh, my life. So that's uh, the short story of uh, my conversion. Um, so today we'll talk about the problem of evil. Uh, I think it's good to start with um, the problem uh, as Epicurus formulated it. Uh, I can read it, how he said it. He said the following. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he's not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he's malev uh, m malevolent, mal malevolent, malevolent, malevolent. Yeah, that, that's the word. Yeah. Yeah. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? Well, this is the problem as Epicurus 300 years before Christ formulated it. And uh, it's, yeah. Uh, my first question for you is, what do you think about this argument? Do you think it's convincing or how do, yeah, how do you look at it? First off, uh, I would like to uh, not rectify, but maybe nuance my position a little bit, because mm. yes, I'm an atheist, uh, which for the record does not mean that I am um, saying that God does not exist, because that's a stronger claim. Yeah, I would say I'm a, an agnostic atheist, um, where agnosticism pertains to having knowledge, a lack of knowledge. So I, 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 I think I cannot know whether God exists or not. 
uh, and my atheism uh, denotes like the belief. I have no active belief in the existence of God. So I'm not denying the possibility that it could exist, but um, I just don't see any, enough evidence for it. And yeah. I personally think that the problem of evil is one of the, well, technically speaking, it's not really, as I understood it during my studies, um, it's not really a, an argument uh, against God's existence per se. Rather, it's like an, you know, it's an argument against a God with certain properties, right? Yeah. So a really easy way to to circumvent the problem is to just adjust the properties. But you know, if you if you're gonna tweak with the properties, then most Christians would not agree uh, that you keep like the the truthful Christian God. So, but yes, I think. Uh, yeah, the Epicurean uh, problem is still relevant. Uh, and for me, it's not so much proof that God, as I explained, does not exist. Uh, but I do think it's pretty good evidence against uh, an omnibenevolent God. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And why do you think it's good evidence? Do, do, you, do you think it's sound? Is, is it like, um, yeah, this is like a logical version of the problem of evil, that if he's really all powerful, he can do everything he can make any world uh, and if he's all loving he would want to create a world without evil and suffering so then it logically follows that he will not make a world full of evil but since we live in a world full of evil this god cannot exist so that's like the logical version of the problem of evil it's impossible actually for this god to exist that's a, like a very strong claim is that how far you would go uh, with the argument or would you say it's unlikely that this god exists yeah, yeah good question no I, I wouldn't say it's impossible no i wouldn't say that but i think it's highly improbable because you know um there's just too much uh, the totality and the randomness of moral and natural evils in the world is just so overwhelming and i mean it even a even a child could think of a world in which one other child suffers less than the current one, right? Yeah. So that to me, that shows that like children are even able to, to perceive of a better world. I mean, that, that, that just tells me that God should, is really an underachiever if, if he would exist. If, if we assume that he exists and is really good, I'm just not convinced. And if he does exist, um, then I really have some questions for him, which some Christians probably would classify as arrogance. But I mean, I I am a loving person. I I genuinely believe people are inherently good, and you don't think so. I I know I've shown you uh, your your uh, parts on this, which was interesting, by the way. But uh, you know, respect in my book is earned, right? So so. If God would have, you know, answers that I can live with from a moral pr perspective, I might be willing to believe it, you know, or might be willing to respect him. But as it stands, I just cannot expect, uh, cannot respect such an entity. And what, what kind of answers do you require? Like specific answers to specific uh, questions about evil? Like why does this child have a terminal disease? Or uh, like in general, why is there all this suffering in general, because those are different different kinds of questions. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I would say maybe both. I mean, the totality of it. I, I, I mean, um, how do you say it? I mean, for instance, the Holocaust, for instance. Why, why did that have to happen? Or why children, in, for instance? Or why... But that's, Why, that's a specific question, right? That's, that's right, not a yeah. general but, question. But in general, you know, if, if you know, if in general, the, the existence of evil at all is is at least weird. If 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 this God is all powerful and all good, in my I, I, that's that's my opinion. I yeah. mean, and then Christians usually fall back to you know like theodicies, like uh, it's needed for free will. I have issues with that. Or it's needed for a soul-making uh, course in life, which I think is a really weak argument, to be honest. I think that's Hicks, Hick, that argument philosopher. Um, and I also have a, a few other specific questions, which are 
yeah, which kind of relate to the moral issues, but maybe not be part of the problem of evil part, but I have some issues with this sense of justice. For instance, I can, I can mention one, which I've discussed with my best friend uh, as well, who, who happens to be a Christian as well. Uh, and one, I remember asking myself this question when I was like 14, and I still find it unjust. That is, I mean, if, if okay, so let's say that Adam and Eve, um, they made the mistake in God's mind, right? And they were given uh, the possession of individual free will. And this individual free will des- determines the destination after the physical death, right? In you know, you, you, if, if you do things that God approves of, uh, you, or you gain acceptance, then you can enter heaven because you made those choices. Um, I don't find it just that these two people, if they, if you assume they really existed, yeah, yeah. Uh, they made certain choices that God did not approve of. And why then is it just that all the people after that should be punished by birth because of those individual choices based on their free wills? That just does, does not make sense to me, for instance. This is, this is just one problem. But I wonder what you think about that. <laughs> yeah, well, let's start with the part of being punished. What, what do you mean with the people being punished because of Adam and Eve? I mean, that we're, well, we're all born sinners, right? Yeah, we're born with the sin nature. So we have an inclination to do evil. So you mean that with punishment, that, that we have uh, in us the inclination to choose evil over good. That's what the Bible says. Uh, so that's why every person is sinful and acts in sinful ways because because we have a, actually a desire to choose evil more than a desire to do than to do good so in that sense do you mean that's a punishment because we are born this way because of the sin of adam and eve i was thinking i, I mean this i i heard other interpretations um which may exist exist next to this one but i've heard people say that like the the, the theme of original sin like I mean, every person that is born is, according to Christian theology in general, uh, should be saved, right? Sorry? So every, every Christian that is born in the world, by defini- not by definition, but it, uh, it is to be saved, right? Uh, but you aren't born as a Christian. Every person, do you mean? Or... <laughs> yeah, every per- yeah, sorry. Every, per- yeah. every person, yes. Every person that is born in the world, by definition, needs to be saved. Yes. So you are actually you are broken when you are born in the world. You need to yeah. be saved. Something is off, and this is, I think, originally because of Adam and Eve's deeds, right? Yes. So we have uh, inherited the sinful nature, and I think that's what you mean. Then that's the that seems to you like a punishment for us uh, because we didn't choose the things Adam and Eve did without the sinful nature, and now we have the sinful nature. And yeah, well, <laughs> what is that all about? Uh, there are actually multiple answers to this question. Um, and one that I find convincing is the fact that, first of all, if you assume that God is all-knowing, all-powerful and, uh, no, and, and just, if you assume those things, uh, then he could be the one that uh, uh, could make this uh, just because uh, Adam and Eve are like the representatives of humankind. And what this means is that if we or any person that has ever lived would be uh, born or uh, born, that's not the good, <laughs> would be created as Adam and Eve uh, were created in the garden, we would have done the same thing as Adam and Eve. And God is able to know that. And that's, uh, that makes it just that God uh, sees Adam and Eve as our representatives and because they are our representatives, we uh, it is just that we have this sinful nature. So this is not, not something that a human person could, could say because we are not all-knowing and we cannot look in, into hearts and we cannot know all the counterfactuals, but God can. And since God is just and all-knowing, it makes sense that uh, apparently Adam and Eve are our representatives and uh, it is just that we have this sinful nature. And what's important to mention is that ultimately we are not judged because of the sins of Adam and Eve or of other persons. We are only judged 
because of the sins that we've committed. I can read what uh, Romans says. It says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. So death spread to all men because all sinned. It's not because of the sin of Adam and Eve. It's because of our own sin. And the sinful nature is it's just because they are our representatives. And if we were put in their place, we would have done the same. And God knows that. Y- you cannot yeah, argue against this. <laughs> well, this- I don't know. I'm not, I'm not really, I mean, I'm not really convinced by it, I think. Because for me, I mean, if, if, if the individual free will is what determines your personal path, then I think it's just not fair that because of their choices, whether they are representatives or not, uh, instill in us our sinful nature in other human beings. I think, I don't know, it's, it, it, it seems like, uh, I think there's a term for this, um, the genetic... Genetic fallacy? Yes, uh, I'm not sure if that's the correct term in this sense, but I mean, like, it's just not fair to collectively punish uh, humanity as a broad thing for the individual actions of well, it's not actually a punishment. It's a consequence of the sin of Adam and Eve. That's what. Yeah, we yeah, okay. It's a consequence, but that that de facto means like we are broken in a sen- in essence, and we need to be saved. I yeah. mean, if I had a choice, I wouldn't want to have that, right? So it 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 it, it puts a burden on you because you're broken in the beginning. So that's well, I mean, yeah, yeah, but but that's fair because if you would be put into the place of Adam and Eve, you would have done the same. Yeah. How, okay. how, how would you know if, if that's not the case? So I, I cannot prove to you that this is the case. I'm just showing you a way to solve this problem. And this is yeah. a way to solve the problem. I, I will not say that this is the only way. There are more ways, but this is this is a way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's an interesting twist. I, I didn't have heard, I didn't hear this one before, but it's not convincing to me, but it doesn't have to be. So no, that, uh, that's true. <laughs> Uh, but maybe let's uh, talk a little bit about free will because you yeah. mentioned that uh, you have some issues with the free will uh, explanation for moral evil. Um, could yeah. you elaborate on that? Yes, certainly. Uh, well, in the first place, I think uh, there is an apparent paradox when you state that God is all-knowing. You know, if 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 the property of uh, omniscience, which states for all knowing, being all knowing, means that you have certain truth, of a certain knowledge of the past, present, and future events. This must mean that these events must occur, because if they wouldn't occur, he would make us have a, he would have made a mistake. You know, so it, 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 I think the property of omniscience and uh, free will are contradictory terms. They can't exist at the same time. So. That's a problem. What What do you think of that? Yeah, I don't agree. Uh, I think there's a big difference between knowing something to be true and causing something. So, for instance, uh, I know my wife pretty well. I know that she uh, loves chocolate over strawberry, <laughs> for example. So if I present her with a chocolate cake and a strawberry cake, I know beforehand she will that she will choose the chocolate cake. But that doesn't mean that I cause her to choose that cake it's just that i know it and similarly god who knows everything he just knows what happens but he doesn't cause it he just knows what people will choose so i don't see how that is a problem with free will so yeah what do you think (laughs) yeah i think it is a problem because for in your example so i mean we're talking about certain knowledge here right so i can have certain knowledge about that (laughs) okay so let's assume let, let's be let's assume that you are certain uh before it happens you're certain about the fact that your wife will choose a chocolate cake all right so let's say let's designate that that time t all right yeah and then at time t plus one your wife chooses the chocolate cake yeah so you know that's there's no contradiction there because yeah. you know you you predicted it correctly exactly but let's say let's say that you uh, you had the same um, uh, knowledge claim, knowledge claim at t- time t. So let's let's have the same beginning situation, and then at time plus one t plus one, 
she chooses strawberry cake. Then I think there's a contradiction because you 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 were certain about the knowledge about the event of eating chocolate cake at time t. So yeah, she but, couldn't have chosen the other one because then in that case you would have yeah, guessed it wrong. But 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 the, the the main point is that there's a big difference between knowing and causing. And if you just know the difference, then then it's fine. And uh, I think why this is difficult for people to grasp is because uh, we're talking about events that will take place in the future. And it and it seems as if uh, because we all, always know that cause and effect is like first there's the cause, then there's the effect. Then it seems like oh God knows something will happen, so he causes that to happen because it's like in the past. But I think we have to look at this not from a temporal perspective, but from a logical perspective. The the reason why God knows something that uh, knows that something will happen is because the person will choose that. So because that's the cause. So it so logically, you have the event first, and uh, then God knowing it. But but be we have problems with that because uh, because we have uh, like. In, in time, it's the opposite. And we think that uh, logic and causation, yeah, is the same, but it's not the same. Uh, so the the event happening is logically prior to God knowing it. And I don't see a problem with that. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's hard to to explain in English, but... Uh, I'm trying. Um, so it, as, as you're so the, saying... The reason why God knows something is because somebody chooses something. So it's it's not God's determination. It's the determination of, of a person who chooses something. And, and God just knows that. Yeah. Because the person but, chooses something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But then in that sense, it seems to me that God becomes aware of your choice. Right? God is already aware. Because in his mind, everything has already taken place. <laughs> yeah, because, yeah. I, I know this is hard to grasp, but I don't see a, I, so, I don't see a problem logically with this. So if, if I may ask, so I think I think you are of the position that God exists outside of time, right? Yeah. Which yeah. I yeah, I mean, for me, that's already a contradiction. Yeah, because, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is this is now we're on very difficult territory. <laughs> I uh, yeah. I have to be honest. I haven't made up my mind entirely about this because it's very complex and it's not my area of expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know, for example, William Lane Craig. You know that apologist. He would say yeah. that uh, God would exist timelessly before creation. And in time with creation. So when he created the world, he entered into time as well. And he could act in time. But outside of creation, he was timeless. So that could be an explanation. But uh, I haven't made up my mind about this yet. That's interesting. Um, well, I mean, for me, the whole idea of uh, an, an entity existing outside of time sounds like a contradiction. because everything that exists does so in a spatial temporal sense or at least uh, uh, at least as, a, as far as far as we know <laughs> yeah that's true but we true but that doesn't mean that's not in itself proof of course of that doesn't that means that we cannot say anything about things or events or objects outside of spatial temporal relatives such as we perceive it i think but mm. but i mean um, maybe we're discuss um how do you say it in English? Uh, diverting a bit from the subject. Yeah. Uh, because I'm, I'm curious. Um, I also made a document with questions and uh, certain things in the Bible that I found difficult. I mean, I haven't, have to be honest, I didn't read the whole Bible, but I've read enough parts to make my decision. Uh, and what I also did is I used a website uh, which has a collection of uh, quotes from the Bible. Um, and I... Uh, I checked them with my own version of the Bible, mm -hmm. uh, and they were literally the same. Yeah. Uh, so I think um, at face value, at least, uh, there are really there's really some horrible stuff in there. I think personally, um, which for me, you know, is is enough reason not to respect the God in question. Uh, 
So I, I, I have a question. I mean, we're, we're slightly diverting from the topic at hand, but I, I'm, yeah. I just have a few questions that has to do with morality as well, uh, which we, I'm just curious um, as, for your response. Mm-hmm. For instance, what, what do you think of, um, <clears throat> I wrote it down here, in Genesis uh, 22.1, um, there's this famous story of God um, asking Abraham to sacrifice his son, right? Yeah. And at the latest moment, he lets him Abraham stop doing it because he knows that God. He knows now that God is uh, God fearing. That's what it literally says in my Bible and on the website. And I'm just, just, what do you think of this request made by God? Do you, do you consider that like a what? What do you think of that? Well, first of all, uh, when you just read it without any context, without any yeah knowledge about what faith is, what the whole purpose is of the Bible and of life, uh, I understand that people could have difficulty with this and think, what is this? Why is, the, is he testing Abraham on such a, ex- in, in such an extreme way by asking him to sacrifice his son? If yeah, if somebody would come up with you you today and say, well, I think I need to sacrifice my son because God told me, we would put that person in an institution or maybe even in jail. So I understand where you're coming from as a, from a secular perspective, but if you read the story in context, I think it's actually a really powerful story about what truth faith means. And um, Abraham lived with with God and he made uh, quite some sacrifices already to live for God and he he's also called the the father of the faithful and uh, what we read in this story is something that is true faith God shows us what truth faith is all about and the purpose of this story is to uh, sh- show us what true faith is and it was also to show Abraham how uh, w- w- how his faith was like because God knew beforehand that Abraham would not uh, need to sacrifice his son it was only to show Abraham that he would be uh, willing to do this that that Abraham w- would uh, had, had such a strong faith that he knew that even if I sacrifice my son I know that God will be able to raise him from the dead or whatever there is some sort of purpose that I don't understand. I'm just going to obey God because I know he's trustworthy. He is uh, loving and kind. And I know something else. And this is a key context. God made a promise to Abram that through his son, a whole nation would be born. And it, it would be as numerous as the stars. And it would be exactly this son. So a- Abram knew that uh, God seemed to contradict himself. Like, okay, you promised me that through this son, a whole nation would arise. So now you're asking me to sacrifice him even before he had children. There must be something going on. So I'm just going to trust you. Just I'm just like that. I'm going to trust that you, that your promise will come true. So this is an example of what true faith is like, like against all odds, just go for it and, and sacrifice the most important thing in your life besides God. And this showed Abraham, that actually God was the most important person in Abraham's life. And that's actually the one of the points of the story. We should have, uh, God needs to be the, the, how do you say it? The priority in our lives. We need to trust and love him above everything else, even above our own sons or, or our family. And Abraham, yeah, uh, obeyed and truly believed. And yeah, so this is an example for us to, to see what true faith is like. Yeah, and what we also uh, read in the story of Abraham is that there's like a big parallel between the story of Abraham sacrificing his son and God the Father sacrificing his son actually on the same pl- in the same place. So uh, it takes place in the same place. And uh, now yeah, a few thousand years later, God actually sacrificed his son. And what, what's interesting is that when Abraham is about to sacrifice his son, uh, uh, an angel, I think, yeah, an, an angel says, stop, uh, God will provide a lamb for a sacrifice. And that's like a big prophecy of the coming Messiah. Uh, and that's the sacrifice that would come for yeah, the sins of the people. 
So you have like a, a type of Christ in the story. So that's 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 beautiful. And uh, you, you have an inspiration of what true faith is like. And the story says that God knew that Abraham was faithful uh, as if God knew something and beforehand he didn't know it. But that's like anthropomorphic talk. It's like it's, it's not really the case that God learned something uh, when he tested Abraham. The test is actually for us to learn something because God is all knowing. So God already knew that Abraham would be faithful, but it would be it was for Abraham to see uh, what kind of faith he had. And it, and it was for Abraham to yeah uh, make his relationship with God even stronger after this. Well, so yeah, but then I would I mean, say. thank you for your explanation. Uh, yeah. You're I mean, probably not convinced. Let, let me. <laughs> no, I, I, for me, it's just, it's pretty sick to, to ask this as a sort of a test, you know, because. But, but let me ask you a question. What, uh, what do you mean with sick? Do you mean like unjust? Morally twisted. Yeah, yeah I mean. Morally twisted, but, but uh, yeah. On the basis of what uh, moral view do you conclude? My that? moral view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because. Yeah you obviously don't believe in God. So I'm interested in uh, yeah, what your moral standard is for judging the God of the Old Testament. And it's, My, it's not like to uh, make a point against you. It's, it's really oh, I know, I know, I'm interested I know. in what your standard is to yeah. make this judgment. Uh, well, it's I'm judging based on my moral compass. And uh, my moral compass is doesn't pretend to be like a, an objective uh, universal law or anything. I don't think that's necessary for my compass to work properly. Um, I, what does it mean for a compass to work properly? Because now means, we're, yeah, because <coughs> then you seem to refer to some objective standard as well. Well, your compass is working relative to oh. what? <laughs> no, no, not an objective standard. Uh, I think there's, there doesn't need to have, be an objective in the human independent standard in order for us to be moral. I mean, the very fact that many atheists live very decent and moral lives is, it, you know, just says enough. And um, uh, natural evolution provides very good reasons for uh, animals, um, humans and non-human animals, to to become moral beings, to to do things as a group. That we consider to be moral of course i mean this is not a static thing in the past things happened that we now consider immoral that's true uh so i i don't think there's like an objective standard but we're always arguing within the time frame and the cultural time we are living in but i don't think that's a problem i, I don't think we need to have like a, an objective ultimate uh, moral can compass to refer to. I don't think that's necessary for morality to exist. So, yeah, that's my view. Yeah. So, so if I understand you correctly, you're a, a relativist when it comes to morality, <laughs> or like uh, uh, it's it's a it's a matter of preference, or is it a matter of something else? I, I mean, I, I'm maybe I'm still. Not sure about this topic, but I, I'm, I think I'm not a. I think the position is more real, realist, in the sense that I don't think there are like moral truth, moral truth. I don't think that that exists. Uh, so yes, I think I'm a relativist uh, or subjectivist, um, but that does not mean that uh, then um, the consequence does not need isn't necessary then that that I should uh, think that murder suddenly is okay or something like that because we can perfectly uh, reach a consensus within society about things that we consider unjust and things that we consider just uh, as a consequence of natural evolution. So, yeah, but but would you say that a consensus is a good a uh, way to determine what is moral and what is not or because uh, <laughs> I oh. think about Nazi Germany right away you know the examples that that can be given uh, mm -hmm. there was a big consensus that exterminating <laughs> Jews was a good thing but the consensus consensus didn't make it good right so there must be something else that makes something morally good 
Well, there, there mustn't be. I mean, it would be nice if there was such a thing, but I don't believe such a thing is, exists. But, so but, we have but, to be, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I actually uh, agreed once <laughs> when I was an unbeliever. Uh, I can remember that I held a similar view. And um, I remember that I was feeling really conflicted within myself, like cognitive dissonance, because uh, I remember discussing with my brother the Holocaust and what uh, Adolf, Adolf Hitler did. And uh, we concluded that it was obviously very terrible what he did. But at the same time, I couldn't judge him i i was not able to conclusively say that what he was doing was wrong because i didn't have a standard to, to judge he was wrong i felt he was wrong and my my moral compass told me that he was wrong but i could imagine having a conversation with him and he would say to me well my moral compass says it, it is right so who are you to judge me who are you to say that exterminating jews isn't evil and then yeah i really couldn't give an answer from uh, my agnostic point of view because I didn't have like God as a standard. So, so I, I I'm curious. Uh, do you have these conflicting feelings as well, or do you have like some kind of solution? I don't think there really is a problem here because no? I mean no because I don't think you need like an objective mind independent uh, moral compass to refer to. We can look at Hitler's reasonings. Um, and his, you know, his, his general motives for doing the things he did, um, and judge that it was immoral. I mean, and yes, maybe there's not like a final uh, universal law-like uh, qualification that it was evil with a capital E, mm. but I don't think that there must that must be the case. We don't we don't need like I don't think their goodness and evil are really uh, with capital E and G are, are really existent things. We, we, we tend to think, we, we, we like to universalize things because it makes thinking easier, but just because we, we desire for such things does not make it true. The same thing goes for... But, but do you things. do desire then? Or No, I don't. Personally, I don't. No, but but, but you, have... you, you understand that people desire it. Yes, I do, because it eases the mind. Just as, you know, it makes me think of the free will argument. I mean, I am personally not convinced based on the current state of science uh, that free will actually exists. Although I have to say it's really difficult because it depends on your definition of free will, which is like a problem in itself. Yeah, that's, we we'll won't go into that. That's not the no. topic. <laughs> no, but my, but my point is with relation to, with, with which relates to the, the things we've said before is that people often, make the mistake of denying the truth of a premise when the consequence is not something they desire. For instance, if I say free will does not exist, then people, Christians, for instance, would reply, but then society would be impossible because uh, how could we blame individuals? Yeah, morally? you don't like the consequence of it. Yeah. Yeah, but that and, and you have to happen. agree it, it does have terrible consequences if you say it, does. it doesn't exist because yeah, where's the responsibility? Definitely, yeah. But that's, that's, that, that, does, that in itself does not say anything about whether the statement that free will exists or not is true. Well, what it does say is that you have to give powerful evidence that free will doesn't exist because uh, I think our intuitions are valid unless there is a very strong defeater. So your intuition is like a, a, an argument in itself. Like if you have a strong intuition for causality, for example, yeah, you can just assume it's true and unless we have like a, a strong case that can be can be made against the intuition then then you can uh, come to another conclusion and i think the same holds true for free will free will is ingrained into us we when when somebody uh, hits you you become angry because you uh, you are aware of the fact that he shouldn't have hit you and it wasn't like deterministic. It wasn't a robot who was hitting you. It was a person. And he decided to hit you. And that's why you're angry. Because he's morally blameworthy. Because he has free will. So we respond to people and to atrocities. To everything that happens in the world. On the basis of the strong intuition that we all have free will. And if we have this strong intuition. Then at face value we are justified to believe in free will. And I think this is a very good 
argument for free will. So if you say, I don't believe in free will, you need to give powerful evidence against this strong intuition. The same holds true for the, uh, for the existence of the external world. Yeah, you could say we live in the matrix or, or whatever, but that's like speculating. And of course it's possible, but yeah, yeah. You, you need to give some evidence for it. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, I think, I mean, I would say that intuition is not really reliable. Uh, I mean, there are lots of studies that, um, you know, that contradict uh, common perceptions of what free will means like scientific studies. So, I mean, I think intuition in itself is not necessarily a, a reliable source. Um, okay, but, but, but then, uh, then I would say, still, you do believe in free will. And I think everyone I mean, believes in free will. I think even people who would say they don't believe in free will actually do when, it, when something intense happens to them. Of if, course. If, if somebody would come and murder your family tomorrow, you would be very angry on that person. You want, want justice to be served. And you're not concluding that it was just an accident, like, uh, like, yeah, like it was uh, a tsunami that came over them, like a natural disaster. Because if there's no free will, then all the evil we do is like a natural disaster. It just happens. You cannot mm-hmm. become angry with the ocean for sending a wave on you or something. <laughs> No, no, no. I mean, yes, of course, I, I, I live my life as if I have free will. Of course yeah. I do. Yeah, so but I mean, if you do, yeah. then then I would say you probably believe it. I no, have I a, with, <laughs> oh. with, with Jordan Peterson on this, uh, who says uh, it's, it's not really interesting what people say they believe. It's how they act. And uh, if you look at how people act, then you know what they truly believe. Because we can say all kinds of things about ourselves, which may not be true at all. But mm-hmm. if how we act, that shows us what we truly believe. Uh, that yes, actually gets back to the story of Abraham. What does Abraham truly believe? Does he really have faith in God? Well, j- look at the act. He was willing to sacrifice his son. So we can conclude, yeah, that was true faith. So yeah. I, you, you have and, to look uh, at your actions. Yeah, uh, yes. But I think it's perfectly possible to live on a certain be- with a certain belief because it makes sense to you. And at the same time, analyze it critically uh, based on scientific evidence and doubt its existence. I mean, that's that's certainly possible. I find no difficulty with that. But yes, I live as if I have a free will, and I assume, I presume that other people have one as well, because that like makes life a lot of easier. But I, if I if I go and reflect and on it and analyze the matter, I think there are really good arguments against it. Um, and, but and, yeah, that, that, to go that, back to the yeah. Abraham. Uh, example I mean so you say that that it's the actions of an individual that shows it's his or her character right yeah it shows whether we have true faith or not yeah yeah that's what the bible says so I I look at the actions or the commands of this god and I, I see a cruel being I mean how can you look at this event in which god already knows I mean, it's, it's silly, actually, if you think about it, in my opinion, it, it, if he is really all knowing, um, so which means having certain knowledge uh, of future events as well, then he is actually putting Abraham to a despicable endeavor, even though he already knows he's not going to kill his son, but Abraham doesn't know that. So it's just, it's just to me, it's... It's just a, a ridiculous answer. That, that's true. Abraham didn't know that, but he did know that God made a promise to him. So so he knew it was a test of faith. Whether he it, it was it was a matter, do you trust this God? Do you really trust him? And do you really have him on the on your priority? Yeah, so, I, I for me that's just I, I mean I have another um uh, Yeah, but but yeah, but uh do you agree that uh, whether we can explain certain passages of the Bible or not, does that really matter? Because uh, I can say up front, there are many texts in the Bible that I probably cannot explain at all. Or that there are many texts that I, yeah, I have difficulty with myself. But that doesn't mean that therefore God is cruel and unjust. It, it, it can mean that <laughs> may, maybe it's because I'm just too limited to understand it. Have you considered that for yourself, that maybe 
the problem is not with God, but with your understanding or your ability to understand something at the moment or something yeah. like that. Is, isn't it better to uh, approach it with a more, let's say, humble... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard this argument before. I, I It's not convincing at all to me because what, if I understand you well, you're saying that my finite mind, which obviously is finite, finite finite, um, right. but uh, I mean, yes, my moral compass is subjective and not infinite, whatever that may mean. But I mean, if I were to to show this scenario of the Abraham situation to a child, let's say six years old, she will recognize that it's it's just it's just wrong. It's just I mean, on the basis of what? On the well, on yeah. her natural. I see. I see two problems. I see first the problem of uh, that you base it on your own moral intuitions, and why yeah. would you think that those intuitions are infallible? And the second problem is. Why would you think you uh, have understood the text correctly or understood the entire context of it? Well, that's okay. well, that's or understood that's... God's mind. Yeah, that, so that, that's like two big problems right there. And for me, the, the relevant question about the Bible isn't uh, if I'm able to explain every text or every detail of it. The relevant mm -hmm. question is, is there a way to know what the, that, that this is the inspired word of God? And there are actually ways to discover that. One of the ways is to look into the person of Jesus Christ. What kind of person was he? What kind of claims did he make about himself? Is there evidence that he died on the cross and that he rose from the dead? If there is evidence, uh, if there's strong evidence, then you can make the case that the whole Bible is true because Jesus assumed the Bible to be the world, word of God. So if you can prove that Jesus is the son of God, and I think it's possible to do that, but <laughs> that's a, maybe not a topic. Mm -hmm. uh, then that's for me enough uh, because I see the the character of Jesus who is mm -hmm. the most loving, humble, perfect person you can imagine. He's like the, yeah, I, I cannot imagine a better person than Jesus. And mm -hmm. if I have evidence that he truly died on the cross and rose from the dead, then I, yeah, I can believe that he's the son of God and I can put my trust in him and trust him when he says that the Bible is the word of God. And then I can live with certain texts that uh, I might not be able to explain, but I'm fine with that because I know that the God in whom I trust is trustworthy. It's, it's a God who was willing to die for me. That's, that's the Christian message. Yeah. So, so I, I, if I have that as a foundation, then do you understand that uh, if I'm not able to explain every text or detail from the Bible, that doesn't do much to my faith? Do you? Yeah. Well, if I can respond to that. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I mean, if you if you can take these things at face value, why should you take them seriously at all? I mean, for me, it sounds like, you know, there's always there's the, at least there's always a problem of interpretation. But it seems to me that not that you're doing that right now, but there are Christians that like to, you know, when it comes to, in my opinion, horrible passages in the Bible which show the character of God, um, they tend to, to understand it in a figurative sense. Like they try to make it metaphorically or, you know, they, they, they try to dampen the ugliness of it. And then when there's like, a, you know, like, like a, a, um, maybe a specific passage in the Bible that is in fact pretty good, pretty nice to read, or, you know, shows some good things, then it's supposed to be literal. So where do you draw the line? Because it sounds to me like you're picking and choosing as you see fit. Not, not that you're doing that right now. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I think uh, there are many Christians who do that, who pick and choose. And I think we don't shoot, we shouldn't pick and choose. I think uh, when uh, when we come to a text and we don't understand it, we should really try to understand it as what it says and not make something of it to yeah. Uh, but why not? Why not? Why make not face satisfied value? or something? Why? Why? Why not face value? Why not, uh, why yeah, not, yeah. I, I think I agree with face value. But that, for example, with the Abram story, I think I did that. I just took it at face value, and I gave you an interpretation that satisfies me. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. Okay. That's fine. But I, I see a literal um, request made by God to test his faith and to 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 show that he's. God-fearing, it literally says God-fearing, I think. That in itself, whatever the context, 
shows to me it i don't know it just it just co collides with my moral compass and, and to yeah, come yeah, back yeah yeah and it, it doesn't with mine but then i come back to the point uh why give so much value to your own moral compass what is it about your moral compass that's so valuable <laughs> and, and i mean this question not like in a no i know i know take it in the wrong way i know well i mean of course i'm gonna judge things according to my moral compass and all the philosophies and all the moralities that i've read yes i mean we we make up our morality we live according to it we try to live according to it and when i see things that are so outrageously wrong in my book i you know i i discredit them uh, i mean and there's nothing wrong with that I, it doesn't have to be infallible but it's it's just a cop out for me if you say that because god's mind is infinite so and his morality is supposedly infinite i am not able to understand the meaning of request made uh, by that, that's not what i'm saying i'm not saying that you're not able to understand things i'm just uh, I'm just noticing that you keep referring to your moral compass and you make statements like God is cruel or unjust. And yes. those are like uh, objective statements, like he's really cruel. No, not objective. Okay, okay. so you, you mean uh, I, you only think he's cruel. So you don't make a judgment that he actually is cruel. It's my conviction. Based yeah, okay, on my but, yeah, but, then, but then I can always say, so what? I have another conviction. And then it's the end That's of fine. the conversation, right? Or, oh, yes, you, you see it differently. That's, yeah, that's, but, but, but don't you, yeah, <coughs> that's, that's actually what my problem was when I was an unbeliever. I imagined a conversation with Adolf Hitler and it would go something like nice. this. Well, yeah, Hitler, you are terrible. You are cruel and you, uh, you should be judged for it. That he would say to me, uh, who are you to say that? I have another moral compass. I th actually think that you are terrible for saying that. And then mm -hmm. I had nothing to say anymore. And <laughs> that, that's, uh, that gives me like some cognitive cognitive uh, dissonance because somehow I know that's not true. Hitler okay. was actually he was actually cruel. There's actually something really wrong with him, objectively. Mm -hmm. But my worldview was not able to. No, but not not sorry to interrupt. But not yes, he was really cruel and wrong, but not objectively in a in a universally like objective set in stone way i mean I, I understand that you you feel the need to have a reference like that but i don't think that's necessary also you know if, if god is you know if if if, if god um so if, if i understand you well god gave you like the 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 the, the objective morality to to refer to right like uh, that makes it easier to to condemn hitler's actions in an objective way no, it, it, it uh, just explains my deep moral intuition, which I believe God laid into me. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, um, I have a coherent worldview. So when yeah. I make a moral judgment uh, <laughs> and, and say of Hitler that he's terrible as a human being, I can actually say that and uh, <coughs> be coherent because my worldview allows me to say that because his character goes against the character of God, who is the standard of goodness. He, he goes against uh, a, an all-loving, all-just character. Okay. But, but if I have to can interrupt, what, what, what does God get his morals from? From himself. He is the yeah. good. He's like what Plato called the good. There's something like the good, and he thought of an abstract object. I would say it's not an abstract object. It's actually in God. It's his character. It's his eternal, perfect character. And That's... I think it actually makes sense uh, philosophically. If you just uh, say like Anselm would say that God is the greatest conceivable being, then one of his attributes is moral perfection. He's like perfectly just, perfectly mm -hmm. loving, perfectly holy. He's, he's perfect in every way. But that's, that's just, I mean, that's just assuming. That's just saying- oh, That's just is. a definition of God. Yeah, but a definition- yeah. Well, yeah, well, but when you say, uh, yeah, where do you ground in? If you define God this way, then yeah. I think you should agree that, of course, the good is grounded within his character, yeah. in his morally perfect character. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you can define God in that way. But, but for then me, you have I, solved it. Then you have like a grounding, right? Well, not really, because just defining God to be a certain way doesn't make it doesn't make it true in my i think oh that's true you're right so so you need other arguments to uh prove that god exists but i think one of the arguments is actually the reality of good and evil i think it's it's 
it's so uh, it's such a strong intuition for for all of us that mm -hmm. it's it's actually a good argument for his existence. You only have to believe in objective moral values and duties, and most people believe in them, and then you can come to the conclusion that God must exist because otherwise there aren't any objective moral values and duties. I don't why know do anything around them. Why, why do we need, according to you, why do we need like objective? uh law like universal definitions of good and evil we don't need them i, I i'm just <laughs> saying that uh most people believe in them because uh, we have such a strong intuition of their existence and i don't you, it, yeah okay you don't uh, but but yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I have uh, problems with how you can uh how, how you can make any judgments then and why would you care to give judgments so like why would you care to make for example, judgments of the God of the Bible. If you disagree with certain passages of the Bible, why don't just think, well, I just have another preference, but why think that my preference is any better than somebody else's preference? So what, ma what makes your moral compass any better than, for example, God's moral compass from the Bible or the moral compass of Hitler? Well, because I have certain reasons why I should certain do certain things and should refrain from doing other things and these reasons th these reasons are subjective i like i mean I, I chose a set of principles for instance i like the kantian uh, morality mm. parts of it i mean i like the idea of in intention rather than consequences yeah, but didn't that. didn't didn't can't believe in objective morality mm. like a categorical yes. imperative yes but objective in the sense uh that reason uh objectively comes to the same conclusions when applied when applied properly according to Kant but he didn't believe in like an observer an, a universal objective capital E evil or capital G goodness nothing like that he was just referring to reason uh, in an objective sense yeah yeah but di didn't Kant uh, actually uh, thought it was very practical to believe in God he didn't believe that you could give evidence for God but that we actually should believe in God because otherwise the consequences are too unbearable a, a normal society cannot function so he, he was uh, like, yeah he was he was agnostic atheist so uh, oh sorry he was uh, uh, no I'm saying it wrong I think he, he was, was a atheist he was an agnostic theist yeah so so he would say you cannot prove his existence but it's practical to believe in him but because yes. otherwise we have like big problems yes yeah i don't i don't agree with that though but yes he, he was he was that in that way yeah but um i'm not sure if i heard your response actually to maybe i forgot about it but i i want to talk about job that story Mm. But because that's another example for me, which I think shows God's character that I disagree with. But uh, maybe I'd, I'd like to hear your view on the state of the world and why what your solution is to the problem of evil. OK, so just generally. Yeah. Um, could you be more specific what you exactly mean? Well, I can say a lot of things. I can give the entire yeah. Christian message right yeah. now, or I can. Uh, I, I, I mean, I don't think you consider it a real problem because otherwise you would have difficulty believing in a good God. So, what is your approach to the problem of evil in a general sense? What are your considerations? Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I am a believer in free will, and I believe that God is love, and that out of His love, He created mankind to be in a relationship with Himself. That is like the, the main goal of life, that we uh, come to know God and uh, live in harmony with him and uh, acknowledge him as God and yeah, live in a loving relationship. But love can only exist when there's like free will. Uh, two robots uh, getting married is not inspirational. It's like <laughs> it, it doesn't mean anything. Something can only mean something if there's a real choice involved. So if you have the possibility to choose otherwise as well. So that means that we must have the uh, ability and the opportunity to choose against God for love to exist between God and his people. Mm -hmm. And I believe that man with his free will chose against God, rebelled against God. And that's the main reason why I believe there is evil and suffering in the world. And since then, the main goal of God is to restore the relationship and to uh, save people from the sins we've committed. because. 
God is not just all loving. I believe he's also all just. So that means that he will not, he will punish every sin. Everything will be punished because if he wouldn't punish something, then he wouldn't be all just. So everything must be punished. But at the same time, God is merciful and wants to forgive us. So those two things are like in conflict in God's nature. If he punishes people, then he's not merciful. And if he forgives people, he's not just. So uh, I see the big solution of this problem in God in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to this earth to restore the relationship with people by uh, dying on the cross and bearing all the sins, uh, bearing the punishment that we deserved on the cross so that anyone who uh, uh, will have faith in Jesus Christ can be forgiven because the penalty has been paid. The, 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 yeah, the, the debt has been paid. So what we see in the cross is something quite remarkable. We see the attributes of God in a very powerful way. We see um, God's justice because everything that's been wrong in the world has been punished. Jesus bore the punishment that we deserve. And at the same time, we see God's mercy by yeah, sending his son to die in our place. We should have hung there and, and died, but he died for us. So that's incredible mercy of God and incredible love because I can think of no greater love than a person who will die for, for his enemies because we, by nature, are his enemies. We've rebelled against him and he died for us. So that's like the greatest manifestation of love. So in the gospel, I see like the whole problem of suffering solved uh, where, yeah, God uh, took on human flesh and died for our sins and became a part of our suffering. So he understands as no other what it means to suffer. So he comes really close. So we can find comfort in the suffering of Jesus. We can find comfort in the fact that God knows how we suffer and he, he understands and he wants us to bring him closer to him. And I think one of the reasons we have suffering in the world is actually to bring people towards him. Because when we suffer, we realize that there's something wrong in this world. And we can also realize that there may be something, something wrong with us. And th there are many people who have suffered intensely and came to faith in God. And if that's the case, I would say that the suffering is very much justified. It's actually an act of mercy of God that you suffered to come to know him. Because after that, you will you will be uh, eternally in heaven and yeah. the suffering yeah. is like uh, a relatively small thing in comparison. So that's, okay. uh, that's like a, in a nutshell, how yeah. I would uh, see the problem of suffering solved in the Christian faith. A few questions. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for your elaboration. So why, I mean, so we have moral and natural suffering, right? Moral, natural evil. Why the natural evil? And why, uh, why why punish or allow evil to exist within children what what, what does a why does a, a child need to suffer yeah well what, first what, what good does it do yeah uh, well first it's important to say that uh, i don't have any answers on specific examples of suffering because i'm i cannot read the mind of god so why certain children uh, have like a terminal illness i don't know uh, and I don't think I need to know. Uh, what I do know is that um, I'm very limited and that uh, it's good to, to realize that when I cannot give good reasons as to why some suffering is allowed in this world, uh, that doesn't mean that there isn't a good reason or that God cannot have a good reason. That simply doesn't follow. So that's the first point that's important to realize. Why, why not? Why doesn't that follow? If God is, co is completely good and, and completely powerful. Well, it it does, doesn't follow that the fact that I cannot think of a good reason why some uh, suffering happens. That doesn't mean that there isn't a good reason. That uh, Yeah, that seems logical, right? Uh, there could be know. a good reason. Uh, really? if, if you state that God cannot have good reasons, moral, morally sufficient reasons to allow certain types of suffering, then you need to explain extremely much you need to you need, you need to explain everything you need to be god himself you need to be all-knowing before why? you can make such a statement you, you cannot know 
No, but uh, why? Because then, if you say it's it's impossible that God has morally sufficient reasons to allow certain suffering, then I can ask, how do you know that? And then I'm very curious to your answer. You can ask me that. <laughs> yeah, I. I, I, I yeah. I, <laughs> why? Why do innocent children need to be raped? What What possible reason could you give that kind of justifies that? I mean. Well. It, uh, it's just for me that's it's just too easy to say that, that that we can know because he has like mysterious reasons but why why can't we judge why can't we judge his actions or his allowance of evil based on our own moral compasses why not why is that wrong i don't understand i uh, think it, it's, I, it's, at the moment i'm just saying that uh, you are not in a position to uh, state with any confidence that god cannot have sufficient morally reasons to allow suffering in children for example well you should okay but then in the example for of rape uh, then then i you could always say it that's free will if you're if, if god would block that then he needs to block all kinds of free will and then free will is gone and then uh, the ability of having a loving relationship with god is also gone oh, he doesn't need to block everything he can he can you you only have to think of a world in which one child one child is uh is not ill one child less than the current world is. I mean, there are so many ways in which yeah, the current world could be less, could have less evil in it. Well, I mean, it's just for me, it's just too easy to say that. Well, yeah, uh, but but you are judging this from a secular perspective, right? Like this yes. life is all we have. Uh, the there's no like real purpose to life. No, if that's not. No, no, no. I'm not. That's that doesn't follow. Okay, okay, but. but other question other topic <laughs> if you yeah. uh i would agree with you that it's very difficult to find morally sufficient reasons for allowing suffering if the main yeah. purpose in life is to have a comfortable and happy life uh, and that's it but that's not the purpose that the bible gives us the purpose in the bible is that we come to know god and live live eternally with him so the context of suffering is not just this life this short life we have here on earth but it's actually eternal it's like a very massive worldview change that you need to make if you're going to think about this from a christian perspective and if you think about children who are raped or who die because of uh, a terminal illness we can trust god that th these children uh yeah will be uh will be in a better place if they I don't, because they don't i have not maybe they didn't even have the time to come into contact with christianity yeah, that's true. So they will not have like the the bliss that a, 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 an adult can have when he really chooses God. So it will probably be a different kind of relationship with God, but that's just speculating. But what we can trust is that God is loving and just and that uh, children who are before the age of accountability, so they are not able to make a, a, a relevant choice about whether they would serve God or not, whether they put the trust in him that God would not send them for to hell, but that they will be with God and that everything will be fine in the end. Yeah, so the, the main purpose of life, according to the Christian faith, is, um, is knowing God and uh, yeah, being in a relationship with him and finding ultimate fulfillment in that. And everything that uh, attributes to that goal is something good. And I think that suffering in the world is it, yeah uh, attributes to that goal it, it it's like a, a big sign for us that some that there's something wrong that uh, there's something in this world that shouldn't be here and then we can ask the question well why is it here then and if you ask it long enough i think uh, you can come to the conclusion that the main problem is ourselves and our sin and uh, once we recognize that we can come to god and ask for forgiveness and be saved and be in a relationship with god and since that is the ultimate goal, I think uh, lots of natural uh, evil is justified in in that sense. And all the people who uh, are not convinced and will not repent, even though there is natural evil, I would say that, and that's probably very much against the way you view humans, but I, uh, the Christian faith would say, and I would say, is that uh, we actually deserve it. We are evil. There's something wrong with us we choose other things above god and that's far more evil than we can imagine so when we suffer and now i'm talking about adults not about children 
uh, we actually deserve it. We shouldn't think about it that we should deserve better. I actually think that we should be more amazed about all the good we have here. And uh, the Christian doctrine about that is uh, common grace. That's what it's called. There's so much grace here. We have so much happiness and so much, so many good things that we actually don't deserve that God gives us that w we should be like <laughs> amazed about that fact more than about the fact that they're suffering. But now we're like in a, I, I realize we're in a major worldview conflict because if I uh, would estimate, I would think that you would say that humans aren't so evil or that maybe they're, they are even mostly good. Or what would you say about that? Uh, I mean, I think the terms good and evil are subjective terms. So <laughs> it, it depends on what, I mean, if, if I think most, if not all people would agree that, for instance, that murdering someone else is wrong. And yes, it's not an objective fact. Uh, there's, but the, the fact that most people agree with this probably uh, comes from um, our history as human beings living in societies. So there are good explanations why we have these intuitions. Those are our natural in, in, um, intuitions. There doesn't have to be like a supernatural basis for that. Yeah. So yeah, I think the natural world gives us an, enough basis for morality to exist. Um, also one question pertaining, pertaining to the existence of evil in the world. <clears throat> um, so what I question is, so if, if, if God is, you know, has the typical uh, properties that we talked about, why didn't he create a world in which people need not to be saved? Why, if he knows everything that's going to happen in the world, why did he create it this way? Why, why not in well, another way? The simple answer is because of free will. And then you could ask, why did God give people free will? Well, the answer to that is because God is loving and wants to have a meaningful and loving relationship with us. And if we really have free will, then maybe it's not feasible for God to make a world in which all people uh, choose God, choose the good things. There's the possibility of choosing evil, choosing against God. And unfortunately, people have chosen that. And uh, it might not, it may not be feasible for God to make a world in which there is less suffering or uh, in which there are uh, uh, more people that will be saved. That could be the so case. Much, so much and so, uh, uh, so much random suffering though. Why? I mean, it just doesn't yeah, make but, any sense. But, but there's like a big assumption in that question. You call it random suffering, but who says it's random? Yeah, well, we come back to this, the point the discussion week before yeah, yeah I, the, the fact that you don't see it is, is not evidence that there is no reason that that's something you yeah, yeah you probably but, agree but, with i i i, yeah, I yeah. can't see why you wouldn't agree with that but if i if i can think of any good reason why a child needs to be raped for instance uh, i mean that's I'm not, not going to respect. I'm not going to respect God unless He gives me a good reason. I, I just can't think of any. But, but in the case of rape, uh, we have, of course, free will. It's actually the fault of the person who raped the. Oh, he can, he can stop it. Not he to can, God, God's he, fault, obviously. He can. He can intervene if He is a good God and He's an all-powerful God. Yeah, but 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 what kind of world would that be? If He would a better intervene. Another world. A better world. <laughs> Re, uh, yeah. How do you know? If he would intervene oh. in that case, then he, he should have intervened in the Holocaust as well. He should have yes. intervened in any rape. He should yes. intervene in every, even every evil thought we could have. He could no. intervene. Why not that? Why, oh, where, because, where does it stop, the inter intervention? Well, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. I mean, it's just, it's so easy to imagine a world in which one child less, is, in which one child is not, is less is becoming terminally ill. If it's so easy to conceive of such a world, but but is. but but is it is it really yes. possible to conceive of such a world? Because how do you know what the consequence would be if if God intervenes in in certain uh, events? For example, if He would uh, intervene in the Holocaust and didn't make it happen, how yeah. would we know what the consequence of that would be? It might it may be the case that because of that, uh, there would be a more terrible Holocaust a few centuries later. That's something we cannot oh. even imagine. Because he could, he could, he create, a, he could create a world in which no Holocaust happens in the first place. Only, 
only if if he intervenes so much that that we no. lose our free will. No, no, no. He, he can also no. He, he, I mean, he can perfectly well make a world in which people have free will, and a thing such as the Holocaust is, does not occur. If he if he's totally if he has complete power and is a good entity. Yeah, I mean, for me it's so obvious, but it's interesting to see uh, how we, uh, how our opinions are so contradictory to each other. I think, yeah, I mean, yeah, but but I I don't I really don't see how it's so obvious because uh, the world is far more complex than we like it to be. Uh, you're obviously you're you're most likely aware uh, with the butterfly effect, for example. That like the wings of a butterfly can have the effect that in a in a couple of uh, hundred years uh, there will be a major hurricane in like uh, the U.S. while the butterfly was in South America. That's like how things are connected. Like uh, insignificant small things can have like major implications in the future. So, yes, he knows. And 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 that shows that that it's impossible for us to know what the consequence would be if God intervened in some natural or moral evil. We don't know what kind of bigger evil would result from that. So I, I would leave it to the wisdom of God to determine when he should intervene or not. And that we shouldn't uh, be in the shoes of God and yeah, say to God when he should intervene and when not, because we are not in the position to make that judgment. I, I really don't see how you could make that judgment. For me, this sounds like the best possible world argument. That's that's actually, that's basically your argument, right? Like Leibniz did. Yeah, it yeah, is, well, yeah. Yeah, God makes uh, the world yeah. as good as he can, yeah. So this, this is the best possible world that God can create. Yeah, with the assumption of free yeah. will and everything, yeah. And I'm not impressed. Sorry, it's just for me, it's such an underachiever. Yeah, but but then I'm not impressed uh, with your explanation or lack of explanation for that because uh, how do you well, know? You, you, well, you, I just take a look. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but but why why blame God? Why couldn't be couldn't that be the That's... result of our sin? You could also make the conclusion that, well, apparently there's something really wrong with us. That the world is so bad, there must be really something wrong with us. Instead really? of saying there must be something really wrong with God, it, you could yes, also because. Shift the blame a little bit. No, it's not a shift. It's actually, it's it's not. It doesn't make sense to shift the blame to us because he's the ultimate cause of everything. If it if he exists, and he is, you know, he is the ultimate cause. So he could have created any possible world. So he cannot create a world in which he will know that people will do terrible things based on their free will, and then blame us afterwards because that's just. Yeah, but, but I can ask you a question. How do you know that God uh, may not intervene in many cases and uh, actually makes the world a far better place than what it would be if God didn't intervene? I actually believe that God uh, sometimes does intervene and stop moral evil or natural evil uh, to make it better. But but uh, but he, he makes those choices in his wisdom. And we are not in a position to to say when he should intervene and when not. Because you already uh, agreed that uh, God shouldn't intervene all the time because if he would intervene at every point of moral evil, then free will is gone. You agree with that, right? Mm, I don't know. I have to think about that more. Okay. Yeah, well, I, th I think it makes sense that if God would actually intervene in every moral evil even a moral th uh, an, an evil thought and he would change it uh, and and yeah turn it to something good mm -hmm. then free will is gone because we are like forced to choose the good because when we choose evil god twists it and makes it good but why couldn't he create a world in which people have free will but they can only choose good things why not why must there be because, evil? because then it, it's meaningless why? Then, 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 then it's not really free. If Why you, not? Because you're forced to the good. Being forced by definition is not free. Well, not forced. You have the options of several good things. Why must there be evil things? Yeah. Then it's not. Then, then it's not a meaningful choice. Why not? Because you're forced to do good. You may have choices within the good, but you're forced in the good. So every good choice you make is meaningless. 
it's not like know. oh well good thing what, what you did here but yeah you could only do good things you're you're, you're not able to do evil things so <laughs> yeah that's why you do it the, the meaning would would be lost and uh also the possibility of love i would say no i if, if well, you I, yeah. I don't agree with that but yeah okay. why, why not i mean i don't think meaning is lost i mean and and even i mean if 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 the evil was really necessary for us to choose well, the evil doesn't have to be the way it is in the world. And, and you're going to say that uh, that we can't judge this because we don't know his reasons. But for me, it's just if, if, if I look at the state of the world, it's just to me, that's just not the, the product of a good almighty God. And of course, I'm going to judge according to my moral compass because that's all I have. So people are going to... But, 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 but would you agree that would you at least agree that uh, you are not in a position to make that judgment like convincingly because uh, the world is far more complex than you can ever understand? No, I don't agree with that. No? Because no, not, not given the attributes that we prescribe to this God. I mean, if, if you're going to say God is not all powerful or God is not completely good, then maybe I understand this product, this, this, universe but if, we, if we're going to insist that he has these you know this this only attributes i'm just not impressed i think i can conceive of a better world even a child can conceive yeah. of a better world so yeah but, just... but what if uh people are really as evil as the bible portrays them to be what if the problem is really with us? Because uh, I, I can, I think I can understand you if you assume that humans aren't that terrible as the Bible portrays them, portrays them, and that you can think, well, why is there so much evil and suffering then? If if humans are okay, maybe not like uh, like holy, but they are not, they're quite decent on average. Uh, if you have that uh, conviction, then I understand you. Why? didn't God make a better world? But the Bible actually makes the case that we are far worse than we think. And that uh, if God wouldn't intervene in this world regularly and wouldn't give us common grace, then the world would be far worse and we would do far more evil things than we do uh, at the moment because God's grace is at work in this world. Yeah, that, That's like a, a major worldview shift. But... If you look at look at it from the Christian perspectives uh, perspective, and uh, for the sake of argument, assume that the Christian perspective is right in this, do you uh, think there's like a reasonable case to be made that the problem is with us and not with God? Well, I was thinking about Adam and Eve as you know the prototype human beings right because yeah. they they committed an act that god disapproved of because they ate the apple from forbidden fruit from the true what was it the tree of knowledge, tree of knowledge good and evil yeah yeah and i think it states explicitly in the bible that before that moment they had no sense of good and bad like no no they couldn't distinguish good from bad right and uh, that's not what it uh, literally says let me say, let me look it up because I wrote it down. Yeah, maybe you should read the text then. I, re I read the parts, not the whole text, but I read okay. these parts. But uh, let me see. Um, yeah, I think I can look it up later, but uh, I think it states explicitly in my Bible, at least, that Adam and Eve initially had no um, <clears throat> grasp of good and evil. No experience of good and evil. No knowledge, no knowledge of good and evil because they never did anything wrong. So they 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 did didn't experience it yet. And that's obviously reasonable because if you haven't done any evil yet, then obviously you don't know what it's like to do evil. That makes sense. But but once you once you do evil, you get the knowledge of what it means to do evil. That's that's I think how you should interpret it. And it's that makes totally sense because well, Adam and Eve didn't sin before, so they obviously didn't have any experience of sin. But you, so your interpretation is that they had an, uh, a grasp of what it means to 
what God well, uh, they obviously had knowledge of what God wanted them to do. They knew God, they knew he was God and they that they should serve him and they even wanted to serve him. And God said to them that they were not allowed to eat of the forbidden fruit. And if they would do it, they would disobey God and would die. And they decided to eat of it anyway, even though they knew it was against God's commandment. So they are totally responsible for what they did. But they didn't have any experience of what it means to do evil. But they knew that what they were about to do was evil, even though they didn't have any perception of what that is like. So I don't see how they are not responsible then or how they're like innocent. And um, just a hypothetical scenario. And, and it's not, this is not meant to, to, to be argumentative or something, but a genuine question. What would you do if God would demand, would ask you, demand of you to sacrifice your own son, for instance? Yeah, that's would a good you, question. I mean, uh, that, I, I, would, yeah. I, I would most likely uh, n not believe my thought. Uh, so it, 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 I think God would have to show me in a very, very sh uh, sure way that I can't get around it. Uh, but I would probably won't believe my, uh, how do you say it, my experience of God because uh, because of the context I'm living. I live in a context in which the Bible is completed. There are no more apostles, no more prophets. Uh, it's all finished. So God's revelation is done. That's the context in which I live. So if God would choose to, yeah, uh, ask me for something like that, for like a, a new story of the Bible, you could say, <laughs> uh, then I wouldn't believe it because uh, the Bible clearly says that the Bible is complete. The revelation of God is complete. And now we live in a different age. So I wouldn't expect God to give me that commandment. It would well, that's okay. Now I understand that, but let's just assume for the argument, for the scenario that it is in fact true, that you have a true experience and that it's, Okay, yeah, l l maybe let's say I am Abraham. <laughs> I would live there and I would get that uh, uh, mission. Then I hope I would do the same as Abraham because uh, I aim to have true faith as he had because uh, uh, God is for me the most important person and I want to trust him above all else. The first commandment of the Bible is to love God above all else and love your neighbor as yourself. So... I would want to trust him even above uh, my own family. And, and uh, would there, so would there be any command or any requirement from God that you would rebel, to, re, that you would go against, that you would not, would you consider any certain thing that he commands of you immoral or would you just always think that it's outside of your moral compass? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard to answer. I, I think if, if, if... Yeah, I think you need to give an example of, of, of something uh, because I cannot, cannot think of... Yeah, okay. So maybe, maybe let's assume that he demands of you to... Uh, well, I've got to look at my... Uh, let me see... So that's okay. Let's assume that he commands of you to kill all innocent, uh, all people of Jerusalem, namely the elderly, boys and girls, children, uh, women, uh, and uh, yeah, just crush, murder them basically because uh, there there was like a, a are temple. You, are you talking about the, the uh, people of Israel who were commanded by God to? Um to drive out the inhabitants of uh, of Canaan? No, um, I think this is, I'm not sure. This is uh, Ezekiel. Okay. Ezekiel. Ezekiel, Ezekiel. Yeah. So there's a story that he, God orders uh, the, 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 the people there in Jerusalem to be, to be murdered uh, because they had like, uh, in the temple, they had like, uh, uh, idolatry like uh, mm. they have like objects of uh, maybe other gods i don't know 
Yeah, well, uh, uh, you <laughs> you probably will think uh, I'm crazy, but uh, I think I would obey God if he would uh, if I would live in that context at that time. For that's that's good to uh, to see that because uh, in this context, I don't see that God will would uh, command something like that. There there's no good context, so I would probably. Uh, doubt my conscience and think this is not God this is actually the devil or uh, my own imagination so but if I would live in the context of the people of Israel I hope I would obey God yeah I can't say obviously if I would obey God because I don't know myself enough to know whether I would have the the kind of faith that's necessary to do that but but uh, I hope that in all circumstances if God really commanded me to do something that I would do it and the reason I would do it is because because I know God is trustworthy. Because uh, if you if you know God, that that's the only way how you can have faith in Him. You first need to know Him. But if you know that God is trustworthy, that He's loving and kind and and just, and especially when you have the revelation of Jesus, if you really know Jesus, the kind of person He is, then if I would know that Jesus actually commands me something, that it's really Jesus, that it's really God then yeah i i hope i would do everything that he says to me because even though i cannot uh, even even if i i don't understand something then i would still think well this is the good thing to do that's that sounds scary to me right <laughs> because it basically if i understand you well it, you're basically saying that whatever he commands of you you do it yeah now it uh, sounds like blind faith because because i i think there's always uh some reason to trust him uh, even in the case of abraham uh, god asked him in a specific context to sacrifice his son and the context was that god already promised that he would bless him uh, through his son and that there would be a, a big nation arising out of him uh, so it was abraham could realize that, that this was some kind of test and that god would bring about some good even though he couldn't see it and uh, yeah, if, if there's a context like that, yeah, I hope I would always trust God. And I think there's, I, I don't think faith is a blind faith. Faith is always uh, trusting something for which you have good reasons to believe is true. And if you really know God, you know he's trustworthy. And you also know that, yeah, you don't know everything. And that at some point, yeah, you can just leave stuff to him and know that the good will come out of it. Okay, interesting. And do you happen to have any questions for this uh, fierce atheist? <laughs> yeah, wh what do you think about the uh, Christian uh, explanation of um, of why there's natural evil, for example, in the world? When, and what do you think about the, the Christian story that uh, humanity is depraved? Do you see like some truth in it or do you see it as completely different from your perspective? Uh, well, it's totally not what I believe, but <clears throat> it's it's the opposite of what I believe. Uh, I mean, the problem of evil is only a problem when you posit this God. If there is no God, the problem of evil does not exist. So there is no evil. Even <laughs> no, not there. There there are things that we consider to be evil, but it's not evil with a capital E. It's not like a like objective law like yeah but 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 if if you believe that why then isn't a discussion about the problem e of evil uh, not some sort of recognition that god must exist there's some sort of assumption of the existence of god if you discuss the problem of evil it, it seems like an in-house debate uh, like between believers because if there's no god there is no evil just like you said there's no well there's not evil in the sense that the Christians want there to be evil. It's not like, it's not evil and good with capital letters. It's like, we are very able to live our lives and considering certain things or actions to be evil and certain things and actions to be good. And we don't need like a supernatural understanding or conception of that. It's not necessary. Okay, but but actually, if you think about the problem of evil, whether you call it evil or suffering or whatever, I think it's a problem for for all of us, uh, because 
<laughs> nobody likes suffering. <laughs> Let's agree with that. Um, and and I think this is a good final question we can discuss, and that is. Um, where do you find hope in the midst of suffering? Because we all need to hope on something. And yeah, we agree there's terrible suffering in the world. And we also agree, obviously, that all of us will die at some point. Uh, where do you find hope? Uh, yeah, but where do you find hope in the midst of suffering? Well, you know, when I think of life, it's just for me, it, I don't believe in an afterlife, obviously. Uh, I don't believe in re reincarnation. I mean, I'm not saying it cannot exist, but I don't see any reason to do so. So for me, you know, um, the time after my physical non-existence is like the time before I was born. So that's basically the same. But for me, life is like the ultimate conjunction of... Uh, it's the ultimate paradox because it's, it's, it's the ultimate paradox because it's at the same time meaningless and extremely meaningful in my worldview. Because yes, it's meaningless in the, you know, the grand scheme of things. You know, we're just, the earth is just a blip, you know. Uh, the whole history of human beings, our existence on this planet is just like a fraction of an eye in the grand scheme of things. Uh, and I realized this even more when I saw the beautiful pictures from the James Webb telescope. I'm sure you've seen them, right? Which one? The the James Webb Telescope has uh, has come up with new uh, oh, it. pictures of the universe. It's really beautiful. Oh, really? They are now able to see like even more into the past. Yeah, you should look them up. They're really beautiful. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> so yes, it's really meaningless in the grand scheme of things. But when you consider the probability of you being here in this place at this time. It's just, I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky to be here. So, you know, that, that, that makes it wonderful. And I think actually the, the fact that life is finite for me makes it wonderful because it, it gives meaning to my life because everything I, every act of kindness, every difficult period in my life, it, it just, it makes life interesting. Uh, and actually the, the idea of li having to live forever in some realm just frightens me. I wouldn't want such a life. I think that would be torture. So no, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with the life. And uh, I have to say it's not an easy life sometimes, but I mean, yeah, I'm really lucky to be here. So, uh, and I think nature is beautiful. There's so much beauty in nature, in the universe. And I don't think we need, you know, the idea of a supernatural being to, to give it meaning. So yeah, that's that's my view basically. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, I happen to think uh, that life is really meaningless if God does not exist. For me, it's uh, it's hard to think of meaning when there is no God, uh, when uh, this life is all there is. Uh, there is not even good or evil. There's just, as Richard Dawkins would say, blind and pitiless indifference. Uh, <laughs> that's what he said in the God delusion. <laughs> but uh, yeah, for me, it's obvious that there's no meaning if God does not exist. Obviously, that doesn't mean that he does exist, but it's clear to me that uh, there's no hope beyond the grave. We just cease to exist. And I, th I happen to think that's quite frightening because I'm so, so aware of myself, yeah, uh, th that I would stop existing. And the meaning of this whole life is gone for me because it doesn't matter what I do. Whether I live like Mother Teresa or live like uh, like some psychopath and just kill people, in the end it doesn't matter. The end is for everyone the same. At the end, there is uh, like yeah, no person alive anymore, no memory of anyone who has ever lived. It's just yeah, blind, pitiless indifference. And when I think about suffering, it's even worse because you can also always think, oh, we only have this life, let's enjoy it. But what about? The children who have uh, like bone cancer, or as Stephen Fry said, uh, what can we say to them? Well, yeah, there's no God, and uh, the suffering you experience has there's no meaning to it. It's just a random event. It's just cosmic accident, and uh, well, yeah, just uh, suffer through it and then uh, stop existing. It's like, <laughs> what can you say to a child? What kind of hope can you give him? Well, if you think about the Christian message, you can give a lot of hope to the child. You can say. 
there is meaning in this suffering and there's a God who loves you and he, he knows what it's like to suffer because he suffered for you. And if you put your trust in him, you will be eternally happy. You will come at your destination and everything will be fine. And this suffering that you, this momentary affliction that you are experiencing is nothing in comparison of the joy that you will experience when you uh, are in relationship with your creator. I find extreme meaning in that. It's like a yeah, light and darkness difference to me. Interesting. Yeah, for me, I mean, I haven't read everything of, from him, obviously, and uh, I don't agree with many things, but I do agree with Nietzsche's view on Christianity insofar as I think that he's right about the fact that the Christianity, the Christianity is like, it's, it's, it's life denying. Like it's, it's, it's a, yeah, it's just a really, uh, almost a fetishism of uh, suffering. Like, yeah, that's, I mean, it's almost as if you can't value the current physical life anymore because your eye is only fixed on the immaterial eternity after your physical death. And that's just to me, it's just yeah. Well, actually, for me, the the physical makes uh, has a lot of meaning if I realize that every choice I make has eternal significance. There will be yeah. like an a, like a consequence to every small choice I make on Earth. So for me, it's like the opposite of what you're saying or, or what Nietzsche is saying. Uh, it, it, and and if there is no afterlife, it doesn't matter what I do. All the small choices have the same result: death and stopping to exist. <laughs> Uh, well, if God exists, then every choice I make will have like a ripple effect in eternity. So that makes life here on earth extremely meaningful. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Interesting. <laughs> well, I wish we could talk uh, more, but uh, yeah, maybe. I, I really enjoyed our conversation. I think we should do this uh, more often. This is uh, yes. new to me to have a live conversation, uh, but it was uh, really good to, uh, to have this dialogue. Uh, I hope we uh, both learned something from each other and uh, that people who listen to this also learned something. And uh, yeah, that uh, it's important to ha to keep having this conversation because otherwise, yeah, you can drift apart and live in different worlds. Uh, it's good to try to, to uh, find common ground, even though it's sometimes hard. <laughs> yes, and maybe also just be be content with not agreeing with each other. That's fine, nothing wrong with that. As long as you respect each other, right? Yeah, exactly. So uh, maybe, I mean, I would like to do this more often. So if people feel like we should discuss another subject, uh, you know, that relates to religion, I'd happy, to, I'd be happy to it. So yeah, yeah, so, well, we should definitely do that and uh, think about a, a good topic in the future. Nice. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for talking to me. It was a good conversation, and uh, hopefully, uh, speak to you soon. Yes. All right. Bye bye. Bye-bye.